Our past president, Skip Kotkins, will be introducing our featured guest speaker this afternoon, Congressman Adam Smith. Skip? But he is widely respected on both sides of the aisle and is truly one of our most effective members of Congress. Barack Obama likes him. John McCain likes him. You may get the impression that I also really like him. I think you will too. Please welcome Congressman Adam Smith. Well, well, first of all, thanks, thanks to Skip. That probably is the best introduction I ever had. Um, very, very kind of you. Thank you. And the only thing I'll say about the sense of humor issue is, you know, when you wake up to headlines like FBI probes of congressmen skinny dipping in the Sea of Galilee, you have to have a sense of humor <laughs> to keep this job. It's just 100% required. Um, and I want to thank Jean for her outstanding work and for those outstanding remarks on critically important issues. Please give her another round of applause. It's very important stuff. And thanks to folks uh, from Seattle here. I've actually done a lot of work on global development issues um, and in the, within the Department of Defense. They are very involved in development issues as well, uh, and those issues are critically important. Uh, and being the ranking member on the Armed Services Committee, that is normally my focus, foreign policy, national security. Uh, but as Skip said, I'm here today to talk about the economy. Um, and as we've looked at this campaign, I get a call like every other week uh, on the national security side, people saying, do you think it's a problem that no one's paying attention to Afghanistan, no one's paying attention to national security in this campaign uh, because it is the economy. And yes, I'm a little bit concerned that we're not paying as much attention to the fact that we still have about 75,000 U.S. troops in combat in Afghanistan, but I'm even more concerned, frankly, about the economic debate. Because while people are paying attention to it, I don't think the way it's being talked about in the campaigns, particularly in the presidential campaign, is particularly helpful. We seem to have boiled it down to a debate about whether the U.S. economy is either about individualism and job creators and entrepreneurs, or is it about you know, community, collective action in government? And we get into this knockdown, drag out that one side doesn't believe in the other. And when the answer you know, is painfully simple, it's about both. I mean, when you look at what's growing our economy, both of those things are absolutely critical. No society, no economy uh, can survive or succeed without both. And yet we continue to have that pointless debate. Instead of focusing on what I think we should focus on is what's the proper balance? You know, what are the policies that will best advance those two things in concert so that we can succeed? And the way I've, I've summed it up for this talk is really, to me, it's about growing the middle class, innovating, and competing. And that's what we're trying to figure out how to do. And I want to take a couple minutes to talk about the middle class and innovation and competition and how I think we should balance those two in some of the most critical policy decisions that we face as a nation right now. I do believe that the shrinking middle class and the concentration of wealth in this country is a problem. Now, I may not agree with everything that's said by the Occupy Wall Street and the 99% movement, but to the extent that they've shined a light on the problem of inequality, I think that is an undeniably positive thing. Now, it's a much more interesting debate, as always, as to what you do about it, but the fact that it exists is a significant problem. We, we've never had a greater concentration of wealth in this country, at least not since the mid-1920s, sort of no matter how you cut the statistics, top 1%, top one-tenth of 1%, top one-one-hundredth of 1%, it's getting more and more concentrated. Um, and you can look at some of the salaries at the high end that make all of the headlines. I saw a headline the other day that the CEO of Apple last year made $375 million. Um, they had a really good year with the stock price, I do understand that, uh, but that is nonetheless a little bit eye-popping when you juxtapose it against some of the stories and complaints about the people putting together Apple products and how little they make. Those stories grab people's attention and concern them. But, but as has been said, you know, if the people at the top are doing well, if everybody else is doing good, it really doesn't matter. And I tend to agree with that. Um, it's more about what the middle class and the people at the bottom, and are they having enough opportunity? If people at the folks have a, at the top have a lot of money, it doesn't really matter. But the problem is the middle class has also 
uh, been shrinking, uh, has also been facing more difficult times, and you can look at the statistics on that as well. Um, but the anecdote that works best for me is, is kind of personal. Um, you know, I've, since I've started running for office, I tell my story of why I'm interested in politics and what got me involved, and it always starts with my father, um, who was a ramp serviceman at United Airlines, he was secretary treasurer of his union, and from the time I was like six years old, he thought I should be president, um, so he pushed me forward. I was going to political meetings when I was 13 or 14 years old. Um, but we had a middle-class lifestyle based on his job. Um, he took bags on and off of an airplane for 32 years. That same job right now, in most instances, pays about two-thirds of what it paid the year my father died. It's not a middle-class job anymore. And there are a lot of stories like that. Um, ramp servicemen now make, they're usually contracted out, and they make about $9.50 or $10 an hour. And what that means is there are fewer people who are in the middle class because there were fewer jobs available for that. And the reason that's important, and I always sum it up with the Henry Ford quote, uh, where he said, it doesn't make sense to have people making his cars who can't afford to buy them. Um, at that particular point in his life, Mr. Ford was not a philanthropist. He wanted people to buy his cars. And if he didn't have a market for it, it wasn't going to work. So we really worked on developing policies to make sure that there was that fair economic distribution. And that's going to continue to be important. But the other thing that's really important, you can't just say, all right, we're going to give everybody the money, um, even it all out. You also have to innovate and compete. Because the other thing that's really different about our economy now from where it was when my father first went to work is there's a lot more global competition. And the best way to sum that up is in 1948, the United States of America was responsible for 90% of the world's manufacturing. Uh, we didn't compete. We dominated. And that was because of a, something of a historical accident and that the rest of the industrialized world had been blown off the face of the map by World War II. We won. We were the last ones standing, and we enjoyed about a 25 or 30-year run. Now it is much more about competition. The Soviet Union is no more. Um, those countries have broken up and become, in many cases, capitalists. China certainly has. India has. Um, how do we compete in that environment? Because to give you another story from the 1950s of reading about General Motors, which at the time had 50% of the world's uh, automobile market, just them, 50% um, of it. But they had a problem. People kept going on strike. Um, and it got annoying, so they pretty much just said, what do you want? we got a mountain of cash behind us. Pensions, health care, higher pay, we'll give it to you. Let's knock this off and enjoy ourselves. That's not an option for most businesses right now because of the competition they face. And we have to figure out how to balance those two things. The policies that I think that we can best advance to do that uh, start with infrastructure education, but also involve trade, immigration, and, yes, fiscal responsibility. One of the biggest problems our economy has right now is the utter lack of confidence that too many entrepreneurs have in it. There's a lot of reasons for that, um, but one of them is because of the deficit and because of the uncertainty of the economic future of our country that that offers. We have several layers of uncertainty on this. One is just the fact we've got a $15 trillion debt. Um, we have a deficit of about $1.3 trillion. I asked Robert Samuelson one time to sort of explain why that's a problem. Not that I didn't know that it was a problem, but it's always interesting with economists to sort of have them explain it. Um, and his answer basically was, well, you never really know for sure how big of a problem it is, but then one day you wake up and it is. Um, because you can't keep the debt. What if the interest rates go up a point and a half? Um, you know, what if we can no longer spend the money on the things we do because we're servicing our debt too much? That lack of confidence is a problem. And then, of course, we've thrown onto it the fact that we have $4.5 trillion in tax cuts that are scheduled to go away at the end of this year. And we have sequestration uh, for the uninitiated. That's automatic cuts of about $1.2 trillion across the board, mostly in the discretionary budget, that are also set to go in. Are these things going to happen? Nobody. I mean, literally, nobody knows. And even if they do happen, January, February, we'll probably try to make some effort to upend them. That uncertainty causes people to want to sit on their money, which is why I say that the best thing that Congress could do to get the economy going both in the short term and the long term is put in place a 10-year plan that gets the deficit under control. We are not going to balance it anytime soon, and nor should we. Um, the cost of balancing the budget, the impact that would have on people would be devastating. But to get it under control, 
to keep it at about 50% of GDP instead of keeping it on its trajectory towards 100% would be enormously important. We could also put in place a tax code that we can depend on for some period of time and a set of spending policies that are at least somewhat predictable. Within that, though, we also have to invest in infrastructure. Infrastructure is one thing that helps the middle class. It's always one of the ironies of countries that have incredibly concentrated wealth that the rich start buying helicopters so that they don't have to worry about using the roads that the rest of us have to use. Roads and bridges and energy, all of that is the thing that helps the middle class. It means you can wake up in the morning and have certain dependable things that enable you um, to go out and pursue a better economic life. So is education and public education. I think the most important thing we can do is continue to support public education. Stop pretending that it's all the teacher's fault, that it's not perfect. Um, I happen to think public education works very, very well right now. Uh, my children have gone to public schools. My wife and I both went to public schools. And if the parents and the community do the work, they work quite well. We need to support them. The one change that I would make is it has to be more practical. Starting in middle school, if not before, we have to start training our young people to have skills that are actually marketable. I love community and technical colleges uh, for precisely that reason. We need to invest more in them. And then lastly, just on trade and immigration. One of the problems that we have as a society is we, we long for those days than we do when we dominated. And believe me, I've been in easy elections. I've been in tough the easy ones are more fun. There are people who will try to tell you that they enjoy the tough ones because it really brought it, that's just a load of hooey. Um, it's, <laughs> it's always more fun to dominate. Um, but that's simply not the option right at the moment. 95% of the globe's population is somewhere other than the US. We are already responsible for 20% of its consumption. If you're business people, you're thinking about growing, you need to get to those overseas markets that are the growing markets. We need smart trade policy that negotiates good trade deals. I will tell you that one of the happiest moments of my professional career was when the United Auto Workers came in about a year ago and told me that they wanted me to vote for the Korea Free Trade Agreement. I hadn't had a union come up to me and tell me to vote for a trade agreement in 15 years in Congress, and I'm very pro-union. It's always been one of those areas we have a hard time working together on. Um, but our trade ambassador, Mr. Kirk, had gone out and aggressively negotiated a good deal, and it was a good deal, um, and it does move our economy forward. And lastly, on immigration. Uh, we too often tend to view immigration as bringing people in who are going to compete with us, when in fact, if you look at over 200 years of history of immigration in this country, it has been one of the great strengths of the United States of America that people all over the world, and I'm talking high end, low end, whatever their skill level, they want to come here and they want to make a better life for themselves and they work hard and grow our economy and make it better. And yet we now have you know, about the worst immigration policy that I can remember in terms of making it more difficult for people to do that, whether it's H-1Bs at the high end or H-2As at the low end, or simply if you're an international business and you want to have a conference to bring people into this country, that's, you know, famously people say that's why Microsoft built their location up in Vancouver, because it was easier to get people to come into Canada for those types of meetings. That is bad for our economy and it is our our paranoia and our desire not to have to compete that is pushing too much of our immigration policy that's undermining our ability to compete, succeed, and grow the middle class. Those are the policies that I think are best going to move us forward. And tied into all of that is innovation. Let me just close by saying the one thing that I'm really optimistic about we live in a great region. And one of the great things about my job, my district now that stretches from the Port of Tacoma up through Bellevue, every week I sit down with that with at least two or three companies. I was out at Intellectual Ventures yesterday um, and then down at a trade show in Bremerton uh, meeting with companies. I meet with companies that are coming up with new products that are incredibly innovative and revolutionary. Um, whether it's improving manufacturing processes, coming up with new ways uh, to deal with our energy challenges, healthcare, life sciences, the innovation is there. The entrepreneurial spirit, the education system, the capital markets, our capacity and desire to compete and change is pretty much unparalleled in the world. In some, we are perfectly positioned to compete and succeed. We just, A, have to be willing to do so, 
and B, have to suck it up and acknowledge the deficit and the debt challenges that we face, make the hard choices, and put ourselves in the best position to take advantage of our very natural opportunities. That's the economic debate that I think this country deserves and that we need. Uh, I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Congressman Smith has been very kind to devote a big part of his program to questions and answers. So we're going to start with that. As a reminder, all of our guests are guests. So be polite. All right, let's, 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 let's go. Thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, I wish we could clone you. Be, you'd be the first to volunteer when they're doing human cloning. Because the problem that I see is we can't find compromise anymore, which used to be the basis for politics. You're talking rational. What goes on in the dominates the news is irrational. What can we do to change that? Well, um, stop voting for the candidates who do that. Um, <laughs> I know it's an individualized thing, but it is a frustrating thing that I've seen as a politician. I think. You know, when you look at the primaries and the elections that have happened, you know, one of the most dependable lines is, you know, I won't compromise. I'm principled. I'm going to stand in the, you know, and people seem to be more attracted to that message. It's simpler um, and less attracted to, you know, the balance that needs to be struck and actually making good public policy. And I think the other problem right now is we are as divided as a nation on these fundamental questions as we've been, frankly, since before the Civil War. Um, I think the outcome's going to be better this time, don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you do have people, and, and people just fall into that camp that I said at the outset of my speech that, you know, well, the Democrats, they just want to take everybody's money and socialize everything. Are we Republicans? They want to send everybody to the poorhouse. You know, they want to give all the money to the rich and hope they take care of the rest of us. Um, and so you sort of break off into those two camps. All we can do about it, all I can do about it is, you know, say what I said and try to encourage people to take a different approach. But I do wish, I mean, you look at that last election in 2010, you know, in Republican primaries, um, when Mike Castle lost, um, in Delaware, and that's kind of an obscure place all across the country, but I know Mr. Castle, and uh, I get the name mixed up. Was it Susan, Susan O'Donnell, I think, um, you know, who had run for Senate three times, who was not, it wasn't a matter of conservative, just a little bit on the wacky side, let's put it that way. Um, you know, and, and my thought was any group of sentient beings, I don't care if it's like a small primary, that would look at those two people and say, yeah, I'm going to go with her. Um, that worries me. Um, so we need, <laughs> we need to vote for the people in the middle. And then in the general election, it was moderate and conservative Democrats who got wiped out all across the country. They were more vulnerable in some instances. Um, so, you know, we got to, if this is what we want, we got to start getting involved and in voting for it. Good morning, or uh, good afternoon. I understand you toured the Global Health Exhibit at Seattle Center last week, and I wonder if you could comment on your impressions and on the role you see for the global health sector in the local economy. Thank you. Well, I think it's great, and I could um, talk about development policy for a long time. I happen to think from a foreign policy standpoint, um, the inequality, the you know, massive amounts of poverty the world over are an enormous problem and something that we need to confront. Um, but from an economic standpoint here locally, it's a great opportunity for us. Uh, we have a synergy in this region of uh, non-government organizations and research institutions that really put us in a position to grow and innovate. And yes, part of that, a lot of that is driven by coming up with you know, many of the ideas that Gene talked about um, globally that have you know, worked to reduce poverty, worked to uh, improve development the world over, but they also, they're innovation. They're you know, life, science, healthcare, in some cases energy. In fact, there's a new movement now, as I'm sure you're aware, called you know, global to local which is, okay, if we have these ideas that are working globally, can we bring them home? For instance, healthcare, you know, using a cell phone to communicate healthcare advice to people in remote regions, you know, well, that can work here too. We have a problem with access to healthcare as well. Um, so I think it can have a huge impact on our economy nationwide and here locally, between the Gates Foundation, PATH, University of Washington, um, we're, get, we're attracting some of the, you know, the best brains in the world to come here, and it's grow our economy. It's a very, very positive thing. Thanks for being here today. I really appreciate your comments about, about the middle class and 
uh, the education, the importance of education. Do you see a, an effect associated with the overall trend towards deregulation over the last 15, 20 years in terms of some of the key pieces of infrastructure we used to uh, count on, like uh, mass communications and the fact that there's been this huge consolidation in the media uh, over the last 15, 10 years because of this deregulation. And that has really kind of fragmented the information we get. Is that a piece of what you can work towards fixing, or is that just the, cow, the horses out of the barn? Well, I mean, and I've heard that, that question. I know a lot of people feel very passionately that the concentration of the media um, is a problem. And I think it is to, to, to some degree, but at the same time, you've got the Internet um, out there that you know, gives voices all over the place. Um, there is greater access, I think, for average people. I am worried about the concentration and the power that comes with it, and I think that is part of the problem. I think a larger part of the, pro part of the problem is the individual choices that we make to only want to hear people who sound like us. Um, you know, I mean, people just, they, they, whether it's, you know, Fox News or MSNBC or liberal blogs, conservative blogs, I've always found it much more interesting uh, to listen to people who don't 100% agree with me. And that, you know, it's more of a cultural thing than a concentration of media. Um, and I just wish it would change. Um, you really can learn a lot more from hearing a diverse set of voices than from just having your own personal thoughts, um, you know, reinforced by everybody. The, the bubbles, I think, are becoming a problem, and regrettably, while technology gives you the opportunity to get outside of those bubbles, it also seems to give you the opportunity to stay very, very snugly inside them if you choose to do it. Thank you for being with us today. What is your position on the uh, Simpson Bulls uh, proposed uh, compromise on tax reform, and what do you foresee as the possibility of any tax reform? Right. Um, I am supportive broadly of Simpson Bowles. I'll be honest with you. Personally, I would like to see more revenue and less spending cuts. I know that might not be overwhelmingly popular. I have a very long-winded explanation for why that is true. Um, but I think Simpson Bowles gives us a template um, to move forward with the type of compromise uh, that I said. And that's one of my reasons for at least a little bit of optimism going forward. Um, it's not like we don't know what the choices are, both on the spending and the tax side. We've had a number of commissions have come up with a number of different studies. The template is there um, if we choose to embrace that compromise um, and embrace the notion that getting the deficit under control in a comprehensive way is what we should do. It's there. Um, I also think Simpson-Bowles is, is pretty good in terms of simplifying the tax code because that has to be part of it. Um, we have a very complicated tax code. The, the distance between the effective rate and the actual rate is just way too far. Um, massive incentives for people to get creative and figure out how not to pay taxes. And I always like to point out to people that, you know, the you know, Greece is about to fall apart, as we all know, or is in the process of falling apart. Um, and you know, it says, well, they have all these programs where you can retire at 45 and be paid forever, and they pay too many people to do nothing. They have too much of a social welfare state, and I think that's undoubtedly true. They also don't pay taxes. Um, which is an equal part of the problem um, because they have all kinds of write-offs, excuses, ways to get around it. So, you know, a willingness to pay revenue and provide is part of how you stop a deficit from exploding. So I think Simpson Bowles has us on the right track, um, even if, like I said, I would probably have the rates a little higher and have a little bit more revenue than they propose. Okay. Yeah. We're down to our last question, I believe. Thank you for your comments today. I'd like to follow on Danner's earlier uh, question about um, sort of the polarization. Uh, former Congressman Mickey Edwards was interviewed on the NewsHour last night about his new book about the parties and that the parties have been responsible for enforcing a kind of extremist orthodoxy uh, among the, the membership. Could you offer your perspective on the strength of the parties at this point? Yeah, it's a couple of, first of all, before I do that, the whole question of, you know, why, you know, why isn't Congress more functional? Why don't we compromise more? The, the number one biggest reason is because we're all in our age group generally a little spoiled because our country, I say it was never been as divided as, a, you know, except before the Civil War. We were never more united than we were after World War II. Um, we had sort of the, the liberal New Deal consensus. I mean, think of all the things Richard Nixon did, you know, creating the EPA, you know, wage and price controls, you know, 
there was this consensus in this country about what worked that frankly made compromise easier. Um, compromise is always easier when you start out this far apart than it is when you start out that far apart. You know, but starting, you know, with Barry Goldwater, going through Ronald Reagan to Newt Gingrich, you know, the conservative movement started to move a little more aggressively to the right, um, plus the excesses, to my mind, of, of liberalism um, started to make people question that, um, you know, consensus, and that drove us further apart. So now you have, you know, people who want much more government spending, much higher taxes, and the opposite. So that's the biggest thing. As far as the role of the parties, I do think that that has become a problem because it is, it's something of a zero-sum game in Congress. If you're in the majority, uh, you rule. If you're not, you don't. And then it comes down to the fact that you've got to win the elections to rule. It's like I'm, I am the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. Being the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee would be much better. Um, and that's a simple matter of getting the majority back. Um, but what I hope everyone in Congress will begin to understand, and I see Democrats and Republicans doing this, you know, it's the cliche of, you know, you run against the institution, um, you go in, you know, tear it down and, you know, say this place is terrible, this place is terrible, and then you show up and you're surprised that no one really supports you, um, you know. And that, you know, is one of the best things from Skip's introduction that he said was, you know, whatever frustrations I may have with the system, I believe in it passionately. Representative government works. I believe in elected officials. The overwhelming majority of people that I work with are smart, capable, and pursuing the policies that they think are in the best interests of their constituents. I think the process works. Um, and we have to invest in that process and support it um, more than we support our parties. Um, you know, and I'm a Democrat. I'm even somewhat of a progressive Democrat. Um, but, you know, I believe that we need to get policies done and support the institution. So it's, it's again, striking that balance in a proper way that's going to be really important as we, as we confront these very difficult choices. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.